really focus on two things at once? My internal struggle of being a white male in a time of the Black Lives Matter movement, defunding the police, just overall cruelty on, on my brothers and sisters. I am called to listen and to support, but can I also do this while focusing on the Ghana ventilator project that I've been working on? I don't wanna take away from those things that are important. And I think this time is a time of importance. Now, I've heard my brothers and sisters, Maud Arbery, as the shots were fired, Breonna Taylor, as the police kicked down her door, broke into her home. I heard George Floyd cry when he had a knee against his neck. Now, there is a knee on all black lives in America. And I can't say that I haven't noticed. I have. I took some time and I wanted to understand what was going on even above the Ghana Ventilator Project because this is what's needed and, and I need to educate myself and I need to understand things more. I've heard the yells of the people on the streets, especially at Cincinnati, firsthand. And I've yelled those same things too. Now, my privilege is not what I chose. It's uh, basically, it's created by this European ideology that came across to America. I am fortunate but it's not a fair bias. My black brothers and sisters are two and a half more times likely to be arrested by cops than white men. This can only be happening to 13% of the population. That 13% is black. So how does this make sense? It doesn't make any sense. Ohio, more specifically, and this is my home, number five in the nation for the largest state that have, or people of color that are being shot. How can 13% of a population be that targeted? Ohio is the fifth largest state that has people of color shot. I can show you here. And that's just with recorded deaths. I was blind, but now I can see. I had an idea, but I didn't realize. And this is a serious issue that needs to be fixed. This is a lesson that we've actually discussed before, especially in our nation. James Baldwin had actually mentioned this. I don't want to paraphrase, so here's his words on this issue. The question of having to deal with what is unspoken by the subjugated what is never said to the master. However, having to deal with this reality was a very remote, very remote possibility. It was in no one's mind. When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither did I. That I was a savage, about whom the less said the better, who had been saved by Europe and brought to America. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. Those are the only books there were. Everyone else seemed to agree. If you walk out of Harlem, ride out of Harlem, downtown, the world agrees. What you see is much bigger, cleaner, whiter, richer, safer than where you are. They collect the garbage. People obviously can pay their life insurance. The children look happy say you're not and you go back home and it would seem then of course that it's an act of God that this is true that you belong where white people have put you it is only since the second world war that there's been a counter image in the world and that image not come about through any legislation on the part of any American government but through the fact that Africa was suddenly on the stage of the world and Africans had to be dealt with in a way they'd never been dealt with before. This gave an American Negro for the first time a sense of himself beyond a savage or a clown. It has created and will create a great many conundrums. One of the great things the white world does not know, but I think I do know, is that black people are just like everybody else. One has used the myth of Negro and the myth of color to pretend and to assume that you are dealing essentially with something exotic, bizarre, and practically according to human laws unknown. Alas, it is not true. We are also mercenaries, dictators, murderers, liars, we are human too. What is crucial here is that unless we can manage to establish some kind of dialogue between those people 
whom I pretend has paid for the American dream. And those other people who have not achieved it, we will be in terrible trouble. We see these issues of European ideas ring in our ears. And I have a platform that I can use to spread something that is worth spreading. I don't want to be that voice. My voice has been heard for far too long, and especially by white politicians. I wanted it to act. And so the best way I could do it is doing my own research and understanding it for myself. So I share a couple more things with you. It also happens that I was already acting. I, I continue to go to protests. I call my representatives and I vote. But Baldwin mentions that we have integrated for too long with European traditions. I think that's true. So my spin is that I hope to promote my black brothers and sisters across the world and that they only have 67 ventilators in Ghana. My goal is not to take away from the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening here in the United States, but to do both of these things at the same time. I will continue to work on the Ghana Ventilator Project, but I, my goal is not to take away from the Black Lives Matter movement. It's to continue what I've been working on and continue to push myself further and to understand the Black Lives Matter movement more. And I think the nightly news also has a call to action to Ghana as well. Start talking about social issues in America, then you begin to think, is there something outside of America, right? And then you begin to say, well, what happens before my people got here? And then it's just an easy you know, connection back to the African continent. So I, I definitely think that social movements truly help to um, politically educate people in order to think beyond their, think, to really think beyond their space. And I just came to it. Ama Oboje was raised in Maryland. She and Diallo, who have both decided to live here, are disheartened by racism in America. You think that, oh, America's so great, but when you go there, your body is weaponized. Your body is seen as a threat. You as a black man being on the street laughing, dapping up your people that you do in your village and everybody thinks is normal, when you go somewhere else, it's seen as violent. It's seen as disruptive. They go back home to some of these same oppressive, very difficult environments uh, for young black men and women with stop and frisk and people still getting killed by the police or even getting killed in their own neighborhoods and they go home with a sense of renewal and hope from being here. Ghana has a population of 29 million. It's politically stable and its economy, driven by gold, cocoa, and oil. It was the first sub-Saharan nation to break free from colonial rule in 1957. Ghana has fought for its independence from historic European ideology and colonialism. So I hope that our digital globalism uh, can make a small effect on this world and what I mean by this is that I feel really close to Fred McBagalore because of the internet. <laughs> I couldn't contact him if we weren't on the internet discussing what needs to be done in Ghana. So I believe in change. We can let the walls of bigots divide us and cannons of hate tear us down or we can work together and build up our own missions create our own spin that makes this world good. I'm not graduating, but I think this man has some great advice for the upcoming graduates for this year. You know, it's not always pretty, this democracy of ours. Trust me, I know. It can be loud and messy and sometimes depressing. But because citizens took seriously the mandate that this is a government of and by and for the people, well, bit by bit, generation by generation, we've made progress. From cleaning up our air and water, to creating programs that lifted millions of seniors out of poverty, to winning the right to vote, and to marry who you love. None of these changes happened overnight or without sustained effort, but they did happen, usually because Young people marched and organized and voted and formed alliances and just led good lives and looked after their community and their families and their neighborhoods and slowly changed hearts and minds. America changed, has always changed because young people dared to hope. Democracy isn't about relying on some charismatic leader to make changes from on high. It's about finding hope in ourselves and creating it in others, especially in a time like this. You don't always need hope when everything's going fine. It's when things seem darkest 
that's when you need it the most. Now, someone once said, hope is not a lottery ticket. It's a hammer for us to use in a national emergency, to break the glass, sound the alarm, and sprint into action. That's what hope is. It's not the blind faith that things will get better. It's the conviction that with effort and perseverance and courage and a concern for others, things can get better. That remains the truest part of our American story. And if your generation sprints into action, it will still be true of America's future. So the answer is, if I can sprint into action and to ensure that with my whole heart, mind, and hands into action, change can be made. Two causes are really one united community. That's really what it is. We're trying to unite the community and that can be a city, a nation, a world. United. So I'm listening and I'm supporting to my brothers and sisters as they speak out against the cruelties that are going on in the US. And I'm also speaking out for my Ghana brothers and sisters who are dying and cannot breathe either. The answer is yes. You can focus on two things. You have to be passionate and understanding and be willing to change yourself and others. But you also have to be willing to sprint into action and nothing should stop you from that.